Good. We're live. So you're gonna do the roll call. We're live. You can go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to me, you, and the Superbox 2020. Thank you for joining us on YouTube and on Facebook. We'll first of all, we'll just have a short welcome from the lead organizer, Dr. Orodani Durango, and then we'll take it from there. Over to you. All right. Thank you, everybody, joining us from Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, all the different places you might be joining us from. I'd just like to say welcome to me, you, and the Superbugs. 2020 session. Okay, so me and the Superbox started in 2018. We had our first event on the 13th of October 2018 in Festac Town, Lagos. And that quickly grew in 2019 to three events in Layfair, Ibadan, and in Lagos as well. So we kept on repeating that event in Lagos. In attendance, we, over the past two years, we've had the general public that includes health workers, students, both university students, graduates, postgraduates, secondary school students, and teachers as well. You know, I missed a wide range of other people. We've had hairdressers, very, a, a wide audience. So the aim of Me, You, and the Superbox is to educate the public about the dangers of antibiotic resistant infections. And we do that using very easy to understand pre uh, presentations by speakers that include both scientists and healthcare workers. Antibiotic misuse continues to be a global public health problem, and especially in Nigeria where, you know, people can get anti different types of drugs over the counter. It's very important that we all join hands together to continually raise awareness about the dangers of antibiotic misuse and antibiotic overuse. So that's why today we're going to have some of our special speakers in Nigeria, you know, people who are scientists, researchers, and also medical professionals to talk to us about antibiotic resistance, different topics, and also to answer your questions. So on whatever platform you're joining us today, I would encourage you to begin typing your questions and our speakers will be taking questions throughout these two uh, events. So we're live on Facebook, we're live on YouTube, we're live on Twitter, on Periscope, and also, on all of these channels, just after my introduction, you'll be getting a link if data is a problem. We also have live radio so that you can join in and listen without having too much data. So thank you very much and see you at the end of the event. Over to you, Flora. All right, thank you for that, Dr. Anitorengo. So I'm just going to introduce our first speaker. His name is uh, Mr. Jide Baba Yeju. He's a fourth year pharmacy student from the University of Ilorin, Nigeria. He's a health content creator for a number of blogs and a member of the Healthy Africans Platform, a nonprofit organization that aims at increasing the knowledge and awareness of Africans about healthy living. GD has been a, a big advocate for the awareness of antimicrobial resistance ever since its designa designation as a public health emergency by the World Health Organization. And he's a believer that everyone must contribute their part to make our antibiotics viable in the nearest future. So let's welcome Mr. Baba Yeju. You're welcome. Over to you, Jide. I'm glad to be here because antibiotic resistance is becoming a major public health problem. And if we don't take care in the next decade, we're going to be in serious trouble. That's not to scare you, but there's still hope. We can still reverse the, the steady decline in antibiotic misuse. And I'll be here to tell you why a life without antibiotics would be the, greatest, the biggest pandemic more than the present. So I would like you to pay attention and presentation. Thank you. So I'll be starting now. Okay. 
Okay, it's just trying to get share his screen to start the presentation. Okay. Judy, we can't hear you. So you might want to start from the fir your first slide again. We can't hear you. Maybe because it's presenting on full screen. Right, okay. Uh, Ajide, stop sharing the screen and then do it again, try it again, because we can't hear you at all. And you're not muted, so we should be able to hear you. Talk now, maybe, maybe it has something to do with the screen you're sharing. Okay, go ahead, Jide, try again. Okay, now I think there might be issues with your audio. So, um, I think the best thing today, do you want to try logging back in again? Log out and log back in. And maybe that might help. No, I'm thinking he shouldn't share on full screen. He should go back to the basic PowerPoint. And let's see if there's a difference. Okay. All right, Jide. Um just try doing it without the slideshow. Let's see if that works. If not, I think the best thing might be for you to log out and log back in again. Yeah, I, I think just log back in because the audio is not clear at all. So, yeah. Okay. Apologies for that. Just having technical issues. <laughs> Mr. Jide should uh, will be trying to log back in, and then hopefully we'll be able to hear him, because he has a great presentation plan for us and lots of information. Right. Okay. I don't know how long that would take. Perhaps we'll move to the next speaker. Um, I'll introduce her. Her name is Farm Haishat Ulufadi Ahmed. She's a pharmacist. She's a uh, teaching and research staff at the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Illinois. Her current research interest focus, focuses on multi-drug resistant microorganisms with a specific interest in food-borne pathogens and methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Her mission is to join other researchers in unraveling the mysteries which are hidden in the genomes of these superbugs with an aim to stop their transmission and hope, hopefully preserve antimicrobials. So you're very welcome, Pharmacist Ahmed. Over to you. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, okay. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. I do have a lot to, to say about our superbugs. <laughs> They've been a menace for a long time, and I wish um, Jide had gone before me. He would have given you an, a historical perspective. But nonetheless, uh, I'd I'd like to talk about how how we are contributing to this menace. What are we doing wrong? How are we using the drugs wrong? Antibiotic misuse. Do you really need antibiotics? Do you really need when you have an infection or an inflammation? Are you sure you actually need the antibiotic? Now we're going to be talking about. These on this segment, infections and antibiotics, a, quick, a few quick facts, diarrhea and flagell use, ETC. Now we'll move on with the presentation. Now infections and antibiotics. Antibiotics are drugs that are used to kill or inhibit the, action, um, the growth of bacteria and only bacteria. They do not work on viruses. They, know, they do not work on fungi. So when you have that cold and you think it's actually bacterial and you begin to use antibiotics, you are actually misusing that antibiotic because it will not work for the cold that you're having at that time. Antibiotics are one of the great advances in medicine. Unfortunately, the misuse and overuse 
has led us to where we are today. That's the emergence of the resistant bacteria and these are harder to treat. It's absolutely important to know when antibiotics are needed and when they are not. Now, fun fact, there is not a single antibiotic that is potent enough, that is strong enough, that is versatile enough to cure every single infection. If you didn't know that, I think it is high time you actually do because I, I find that a lot of people do not even know that um, ampiclox cannot be used for certain kinds of infection. They just go ahead and use ampiclox for everything they see, for every inflammation they see, for everything they go ahead and use it. So all the antibiotics have their different roles to play. Now, antibiotic resistant bacteria cannot be fully inhibited or killed by an antibiotic. This is because they're now superbugs. And what are superbugs? These are organisms that have mutated, they have evolved, they have changed such that they are able to fight the action of these antimicrobials or antibiotics when they are used. And you and I have a lot of role to play in, in this emergence of superbugs that we'll see as we go on. Now, taking antibiotics too often and at sublethal doses can lead to creation of superbugs. Now, think back to the times that you have used flagell for every time you have a stomach upset. Think back to the times when you just see something in your ear and you go ahead and buy ciprofloxacin. Now, we use this antibiotic so often, we just create a cocktail of um, antibiotics in our bodies. And then many times we don't even use them the way we're supposed to. Antibiotics should be used for a minimum of five days. But many times we just use them until we feel better, which means if we feel better in two days, many of us just drop the antibiotic and think it is fine. It is not. We are creating in, uh, microorganisms that are now antibiotic resistant. And did you also know that children in low and middle and uh, middle income countries are receiving an average of 25 antibiotic prescriptions in their first five years of life? Many times you find mothers just randomly go and tell, just buy antibiotics for their children. You know, before the child is five, they have used Flagyl, they have used Cipro, they have used Ampiclox, they have used different categories of um, antibiotics. And this, what this does is that it reduces the body's ability to actually fight these pathogens. Does this um, disease causing organisms. It reduces the ability of the body to fight as they grow. And this also is recipe for antibiotic resistance. You know, when you just keep feeding the children with antibiotics, many times at sublethal doses, we're just creating superbugs and we don't even know it. Now, the first case, one of the most common cases that we have in Nigeria of antibiotic misuse and abuse is the case of diarrhea and flagell and sometimes tetracycline too. Now, first thing you need to know that is that when you have diarrhea, the culprit may not be bacteria. Again, the culprit may not be bacteria. Your, your, your stomach ache might not be as a result of a bacterial infection. Not all cases of diarrhea are caused by bacteria. It might not be an infection. Therefore, the use of flagell for every episode of diarrhea is uncalled for. So sometimes it could just be that you're lactose intolerant and you don't even know. So when you take something dairy, um, maybe you take milk or you take cheese, you begin to have that stomach upset and you think that maybe it's a bug and then you go ahead and use your flagell. Many times you even just pop one or two tablets in your mouth and you stop. This is wrong in every way. And it's a very common problem here. Everybody wants you just ask, ah, what can I use for this? You just go flagell. No, this is wrong. There's several other causes. It could be that you're reacting to something you ate. You know, you might be just irritable bowel syndrome. Something you ate might have just upset your tummy at the time. And then you just have to eliminate it. It's usually self-limiting. So you need to be patient, and actually know what is wrong with you before you go ahead and use antibiotics. Now, do not stop at one tablet. I have seen so many people when they buy a sachet of flagell, they go ahead and just pop one in their mouth and they go to the toilet once and it's over. Knowing that the flagell didn't even do anything, but they have already introduced sublethal dose of this flagell into their bodies, thereby just laying foundation for chaos. Now, a little tip, ensure you're not lactose intolerant before you ingest that dairy product. That may be the cause of your constant diarrhea. Now, I've heard that some people use antibiotics to cleanse the blood. I'm shocked too. I, I, I'm really shocked. This is no myth. Some people actually use antibiotics such as the ampiclox that you know, the cipratab that you know, as detox to eliminate toxins from their body. 
I don't I do not know how they got to think this or what is the mechanism of action but word of advice please stop it just don't do it it is wrong in every single way you can't just begin to swallow antibiotics because you feel it cleanses your system what is wrong with your system we have microorganisms residing in us already. I have E. coli in my stomach. It helps me with digestion. You also do. I have stuff on my on my skin. These things have the they they have the, the certain purpose on our bodies, and we can't just begin to swallow antibiotics. There's something called supra infection. When you use antibiotics at a point, even the good microorganisms on your body they are killed, and then it now gives way for the bad microorganisms to actually cause some kind of problem. For instance, in women, when, when, they, when they swallow too many um, antibiotics, at a point, the, the organism that's supposed to stabilize the pH in the vaginal area, they die. And then it gives room for yeast to, to thrive. And then they begin to have thrush continuously. And they do not know why. They, do not, they don't even know that it's because of the antibiotics they have been swallowing. Now, a little tip, there are several medication and home remedies that exist for detoxification. Explore these. Leave antibiotics alone. Now, we do not... Do not emphasis use ampiclox as contraceptive. The first time I heard this, I was wowed. Antibiotics, they kill or prevent growth of bacteria. Contraceptives, on the other hand, prevent conception by several mechanisms. They are not to be interchanged. An antibiotic cannot act as a contraceptive, and a contraceptive cannot act as an antibiotic. They are different. Newsflash, if it seems like ampiclox worked for you as a contraceptive, you are probably not at a point in your cycle where you could conceive to start with. So conception wasn't even going to happen. So it's not as if the ampiclox worked for you. You are just not going to conceive even at that point. Now, a little tip, there are other drugs labeled contraceptive in the market, and you just need to visit your family planning consultants. Now, not all colds are treated with antibiotics. You have to know, is it bacterial or is it viral? There's something called the flu. It's called the flu because it is caused by a virus called influenza. And there's no amount of antibiotics you can use that would treat influenza. Most times when you have a cold that is caused by, by influenza, it's self-limiting, meaning in a few days to in a few days it should go on its own. You know, the body would have eliminated all of the viruses on its own without the aid of antibiotics. Now, the cold-like symptoms you may experience can either be caused by a bacteria or a virus. So before swallowing that drug, you might want a proper diagnosis. Word of advice, before purchasing and swallowing that antibiotic, you might want a proper diagnosis. Again, not all colds require the use of antibiotics. You continue to misuse antibiotics and you continue to create a, a haven for superbugs and we do not want that. Because some colds might be caused by viruses, the symptoms can be self-limiting. You might just want to leave it, take a lot of water, keep yourself hydrated, keep yourself bundled up and this viral infection would leave the body. Now, acne, when, when are antibiotics needed? That zits that you have on your face might not be infected. Just like many other inflammations that you might see, acne inflammation may not be infected by a bacteria. It may not require the use of antibiotics. You, know, you just can't see a bump on your face and tell yourself this thing needs. I see people swallowing doxycycline all the time because they have acne on their faces. True, bacteria can trigger some inflammation. Um, some acne inflammation, but not every inflammation on your face is actually bacterial. Acne in adolescence is a phase and it will pass. Just because your 15 year old has a lot of acne on their face does not mean that you just go ahead giving them different types of antibiotics with the hope of clearing it. When oils and dead skin block hair follicles, this results in an inflammation that we know as acne. You know, when the face is too oily, everything just clogs up our hair follicles, it just blocks everything, and then it swells out. That is what you see as the acne. Hormones, as well as certain kinds of food, can trigger the formation of acne. Peanuts, oily food, greasy food, they can trigger acne, so it's not always bacterial. So you don't always have to use um, antibiotics. You just need to wash your face properly to remove the oils, eat right, moisturize your skin, and drink a lot of water. These are the things that you require. Now, you and I have a part to play. Me as a healthcare practitioner, I have a part to play and you also have a part to play. You never share your antibiotics just because that antibiotic worked for your UTI does not mean it will work for the other person's abscess. Just because it works for you for a certain thing doesn't mean it will work for the other person. So never share your antibiotics. Allow that person seek professional help. Stop self-medication. You know, some infections may be treated at home, but many require proper diagnosis and medication. I have 
attended to someone before who kept using paracetamol for a headache. He kept using all kinds of analgesics. In the end, when proper diagnosis were done, he, he found out that he had an inner ear infection that was giving him that um, headache. So until the inner ear infection was cured, the headache did not go. So you need proper diagnosis many times. Then you need to take your medications accordingly. If you're told to take your antibiotics three times a day, maybe 400 milligrams, three times a day for seven days, please take your medications according to how they are prescribed. Now, we all need to be responsible. It's not just COVID-19 that will make us wash our hands. Be responsible, wash your hands. Make sure you don't pass your germs from one person to the other, such that if you even have some kind of super bug on you, you do not pass it to the next person. It stops where you wash your hand. And, um, that's about it. I do hope you learned a thing or two. And let's all just be responsible and stop the transmission of superbugs. Thank you. Thank you very much for that from Ahmed. Do we have any questions to pose to our speaker? Okay. So one of the questions is, can you tell us what are superbugs? Okay, superbugs, they're microorganisms that ordinarily would be, um, would be killed or their growth would be inhibited by antibiotics. But the, the, due to evolution, due to um, misuse, overuse, underuse of antibiotics, some of these organisms have gained the ability to fight the action of the antibiotics. You know, it's just like humans. If I see danger, I automatically build walls and, you know, try to protect myself. These microorganisms are the same. You know, when they see danger, they just, they just build defense against this thing. So um, ordinarily, some of them are weak and they would actually succumb to the antibiotics. But the superbugs are those ones that have developed the ability to fight the antibiotics. They do not die by the action of normal antibiotics. So these, these are the superbugs that have evolved over time, mostly due to human activity. Thank you. Any more questions for Farm Hamed? At least now we know what superbugs are. <laughs> Anyone on here on Zoom would like to ask a question about superbugs? You can just raise your hand if you have any questions. If not, we'll move on to the next next speaker. Oh, you, well, the next speaker was the previous speaker. <laughs> can you tell us what is, what is acne? Oh, pimples. <laughs> okay, okay. Pimples, yeah. acne, is it? You know, those, those small swellings or sometimes big swellings that we see on the faces. You know, when the face is oily, that's what we call acne. No, but mm. sometimes you just have one or two. Is that acne? It's acne. Even if you just have one or two and then they disappear after a few days. <laughs> It's acne. It's just okay. different. Like I said, there are several things that can cause um, acne in the, on the face. So it's acne. Sometimes some people have what they call we generally term as I don't think it's actually a real word, but it's called bacne. You find acne on okay. the back. Oh yes, yeah, so, bacne. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. So yes, it's acne. <laughs> and okay, so the one on the back and the one on the face would it be the same treatment usually? It's the same thing. Okay. You find on the chest sometimes, on the face, in the ear, on the back, it's all acne. Some of the them ears, are hormonal, wow. some of them are bacterial. So there are different causes, but it's not always bacterial. Not always. Okay. Thank you. There's one question. Can you tell us more how antibiotics are different from contraceptives? Yes, I can. <laughs> now, antibiotics, they are meant to inhibit the growth of bacteria or kill them. This means that they are meant to prevent and um, stop infections, you know, just cure infections. Now, an mm -hmm. infection is different from prevention of pregnancy. A contraceptive is meant to act in several ways to prevent pregnancy. Now, let me give you an example of how a contraceptive will work. Now, there is something called spermicide. A spermicide will work in a way that it would stop or it would kill sperm cells, but it is targeted at sperm cells. It is not an antibiotic. The content of a spermicide is not the same as the one we swallow 
to stop infections. Now there is the diaphragm. This one is a physical barrier. It's just meant to stop the sperm cells from reaching the egg. This is also stopping pregnancy. But you can't tell me that you would use a diaphragm to, to kill or to, to stop a boil on your face. And you can't go ahead and use an antibiotic that is meant for a boil on your face to prevent pregnancy in the womb. So there are two, their worlds apart. They are worlds apart. And if you have ever used antibiotic as a contraceptive and it worked for you, in quotes, it didn't exactly work for you. You are most likely not at a time in your cycle where you could even take in. Mm. So please do not use them interchangeably. interchangeably. An antibiotic cannot work as a contraceptive and a contraceptive cannot work as an antibiotic. Thank you. That's, that's the message. An antibiotic cannot work as a contraceptive and a contraceptive cannot work as an antibiotic. Yes. I think we need to tweet that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? So someone just a comment. So a spermicide cannot kill bacteria and, a ba um, uh, and vice versa. Yes. Spermicide is spermicide. You know, okay, let, let, me, let me break it down a little. You see, if I'm targeting algae, I want to kill algae, I'll use an algae site. If I'm targeting fungi, I'll use a fungicide. Mm -hmm. If I'm targeting virus, I'll use a viricide. Do you understand? Yeah. So if I'm targeting sperm, I will use a spermicide. A bactericide will destroy bacteria. Antibiotics are bactericidal or bacteriostatic. Okay, I'm going too far, but yeah. you get the point. <laughs> yes. You get the point. Thank you. Any more questions? No, no more. Just uh, 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 we had uh, some of the audience that are listening live clapping for Nikke Kende on Facebook. Thank uh, you. She's listening from, from Lagos. Fantastic. Um, I think we will leave this other question. We'll take it for um, what is U UTI, please. So we, we either take it now or we leave it for the uh, a medic, uh, for our doctor that is coming on at the end. Perhaps our doctor should take that one. <laughs> okay, sorry. So we'll leave it for later then. So yes. for those who are listening on the radio, we've got um, Farm, Farm Haishat Olufadi Ahmed who has just finished speaking to us now. Um, and then, so I'm going to hand over, she just spoke about antibiotics misuse. Can antibiotics really work for that infection? So in case people don't know, we are live on Me, You and the Superbox radio, and the link has been posted on all our platforms. So if you are having any issues with data, you can easily click that link. You don't need to download anything. You just click the link and start listening straight away. Okay, somebody, okay. Um, Nick K in there, I can see your message from Facebook. Is there a website where these slides can be seen? All right, we will be sharing, asking our speakers for their permission, and then we'll know if we can share that at a later date. All right, okay. Thank you very much, Nick, for that comment. Thank right. you very you much. Can. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next speaker, who was our, should have been our previous speaker, I'll just reintroduce him again, just for the benefit of those who've joined. His name is Mr. Jide Baba Yeju. He's a fourth year pharmacy student from the University of Ilori, Nigeria. He's a health content creator for a number of blogs and a member of Healthy Africans Platform, a nonprofit organization that aims at increasing the knowledge and awareness of Africans about healthy living. Jide has been a big advocate for the awareness of antimicrobial resistance ever since its de designation as a public health emergency by the World Health Organization. And he's a great believer that everyone, every single one of us must contribute their part, our part to make our antibiotics viable in the nearest future. So welcome, Mr. Baba Yeju. to be here because the matter of antibiotics resistance is becoming very, I won't say scary, but I would, I would like to say scary so that others can be scared and inform others too. Um, how would I put this now? The top, I'll be speaking about life without antibiotics, the biggest pandemic. I would, I would like to take this from the aspect of coronavirus pandemic that is currently happening. The coronavirus has claimed a lot of lives. The, the, like, in, uh, the pandemics in the past, the influenza pandemic also claimed a lot of lives. 
But the life without antibiotics will claim much more. So I want us to really be prepared and be ready to do our part. I'm ready to do my part. I hope you're ready to do yours too, immediately after listening to this presentation. So I'll be starting now. Please permit me to share my screen, ma'am. Okay. Dr. Oride, please make him co-host so that he's able to share his screen. Thank you. All righty. So you go ahead, Jide. You should be able to do that now. Yeah. Can you hear me well, ma'am? Yes, we can. Yes, like I said earlier, the title of my talk would be Life Without Antibiotics, The Biggest Pandemic. First of all, what are antibiotics? Like many of us have gone to the pharmacy or the patent medicine stores at any point in time and asked the, doc, the pharmacist or whoever is on duty, give me penicillin, give me ampicillin, give me tetracycline. Some might be from a doctor's prescription. Some might just be, okay, I'm using my discretion. I have to mark it. Let me just take uh, penicillin. Let me just take uh, flagyl. That's metronidazole. And some of, so, sometimes you might be right. Sometimes you might be wrong. But the best, the best way of using antibiotics is under a, under a doctor's prescription. Don't just guess that, okay, my stomach is paining me. Ah, it would, be, it would likely be from a, a bacterial infection. It might be gastroenteritis. That's inflammation of the, of the, of the um, gastric tract. Let me just take an antibiotic and it will go. But it's not, it's not so. It's not advisable. So what are antibiotics? Antibiotics are medicine, simply medicine that can kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria to cure infections. In every case, an antibiotic might not always kill the bacteria. Sometimes it might have to inhibit the growth for it to work. So there are common infections that caused by bacteria such as pneumonia or tuberculosis. Antibiotics are under a broader class of medications known as antimicrobials. From the word antimicrobials, yeah, microbials are organisms, microorganisms that have life and antis against. So you know that any micro antimicrobial is against any microorganism causing infection. And so antimicrobial drugs are not all, all, always antibiotics. Some antimicrobial drugs might be antiviruses, such as those used by, used by HIV, people with HIV, that's antiretroviral drugs. Some might be antifungal, such as those used for yeast and ringworm. This common thing you probably refer to as lapa lapa. That's an example of a fungal infection that you might have to use an antibiotic for. Antibiotic may be effective against only one or multiple types of bacteria. That means for penicillin, penicillin might actually might be used to treat um, boys. This common infection where there's there's the presence of, of pus in the skin or ear infections. So common antibiotics we have penicillin, tetracycline. That's I think this one is yellow and red. Flagyl, that's the pop. I think people pop that a lot. Ampicillin, that is a mixture of two antibiotics, ampicillin and coxacillin. Augmentin by GSK is a mixture of amoxicillin and clavulanic acid. Septrin, that's is is, the, is septrin is actually the trade name, but it's a mixture of two antibiotics: trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole, ciprofloxacin, and so on. So first, now we have antibiotics. Thank God. But I was like before antibiotics. Before we discover antibiotics, infections were a matter of life and death. Imagine someone having something as simple as as simple now as this entry, but the treatment is as cancer, where without a cure, the person is slowly losing electrolytes from the body, is losing weight. From there, it might lead to death because there are no infection, there are no, there's, there's no known cure. There was no cure. It was just a matter of let's just see how it goes. And the more you see how it goes, the more people die. Wounds, this common wounds like we have today. Wounds were likely to be infected by bacteria, and the absence of cure spells and condition of death or death. It was even worse in those days because they didn't even know how infections were caught. So, so even they probably cover the face of the wound or say, okay, let's keep this wound fresh so that there will be no infection, there will be no chance for bacteria to attack it. They didn't know, so it was really, it was really scary back then. Yeah, infections, this common infections that we have that you say, oh, um, my daughter, get me some flux vaccine, my son, get me some flux vaccine, or you go by yourself to say, okay, let me get some flux vaccine, I have a ear infection. Um, let me just pop the pill, and from there you get relieved or ear drops. Those days, it was so worse that because there was no cure, it was spread to the brain, causing severe problems. This is a perfect picture of a man back then with serious respiratory infection like tuberculosis. Back then, they just used to say, "Okay, you have tuberculosis." They will put you in a room with fresh air and say, "Let's just see how your immune system does." Immune system might not be strong enough. Your immune system might be strong enough. There are people that. 
we weaken the immune system, like COVID-19 mm -hmm. has taught us, people that are above 65 years of age, like you can see, so if they have tuberculosis, do we now say, okay, let's just put them in the room and see how the immune system does? No, but thank God for antibiotics, the same is not the case anymore. How, how did antibiotic discovery revolutionize medicine? Early in the 20th century, in particular 1928, Alexander Fleming, a scientist, discovered an antibiotic by mistake. The first antibiotic that was penicillin, the common penicillin we have, the point ointment and so on. He discovered penicillin by mistake. Can you imagine? They were, I'm sure they were trying to say, okay, we are going to, they were trying to give all their, they, they were giving in their all to make sure there was no, there, there was an antibiotic to use, there was a cure. They had probably studied the bacteria and say, okay, this is what we are going to do, we are going to do this. But the efforts were probably were in vain until Alexander Fermi found the first antibiotic penicillin by mistake. Discovery changed the world of medicine, no doubt. Infections that are previously severe and often fatal could be easily treated. I can imagine how happy they were back then when people didn't have to die from ordinary wound infections anymore. How people that had probably infections could take anti tetanus vaccine and say, okay, yes, I, I am, I'm, free, I'm, free from, I'm free from a tetanus infection. As a result, human life expectancy severely increased. I can imagine how the how people, how the mortality rates from infections in, reduced that time. I'm sure there was there were probably not a lot of diseases like cancer back then as it is now. So infections were probably their big threat like cancer today. And that age from 1950 to 1960 was a golden age of antibiotics. Antibiotics were so special. They were known as a miracle cure. So antibiotic resistance, a new dawn. Immediately Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. He said, yes, we should get ready. There will be a resistance. Antibiotics will try to survive. And like humans, I don't think I would, I would see someone trying to shoot at me today and I would not escape. Or if I can't escape, I'll, I'll, I'll try to fight the person if I can. That's if I'm a cat with nine lives, probably. I'll say, okay, I'm going to fight. I'm not going to get killed. Antibiotics are like us too. They don't want to die. Nobody wants to die. So they will say, okay, I'm going to fight back. But they don't have guns. They don't have knives. The only thing they can do is to mutate their genes, probably say, okay, I'm going to develop resistance. This antibiotic cannot kill me anymore. So, of course, some bacteria are naturally resistant to antibiotics. We have no problem with that. But the problem is that we are causing a big problem. People are due to ex excessive use for inappropriate use. Like my the earlier speaker said, she said, when you take an antibiotic, you say, ah, okay, I have a stomach ache. You don't know if anything that you don't know what's wrong with you. You are just guessing, okay, probably it's a bacterial infection. Then you take flagyl, you take it once, you feel good. I'm like, oh, thank God, I'm good now. Then probably it's remaining like four tablets more for you to complete. You just drop it and say, I'm feeling fine, your myeloma. I'm not using it again. Uh, I, I can't be popping pills when I'm already feeling fine. But also, do you know that the little you've used can cause resistance? Not because it's not effective, but because you did not complete it. The antibiotic, the, the microorganism has not fully died. So it will, it will, it will, it will, there will be a resurgence. There will be a resistance, but it will not come back immediately. It will probably be at a later date. that you use maturity, that you use flagell again, it will work. Use magic again to work. But I assure you, there's one day, if you don't, if we don't work, all watch it, there's one day that the flagell would not work and we'll be in serious trouble. So, so what does what do microorganisms that become resistant cause? They become superbugs. They be, genetically mutate to become superbugs. This way, they reproduce faster, they become extremely hard to treat. You can try 5,000 antibiotics, which should not work. They cause longer illnesses, illnesses that probably the immune system will probably be able to fight in a day or two. If I say for two weeks, two months, three months, four months, six months, seven months, I think that's going to be really bloody. Then death in the long instance, if there's no treatment. And the funny thing about this stuff is that people might then think, okay, if if 400 milligrams twice a day does not work, I'll try 400 milligrams six times daily. I'll try 400 milligrams 12 times daily. If I bombard it with antibiotics, it would not work. But imagine someone that has a bulletproof. No matter how much you shoot the person, as long as the bulletproof is good enough, the person would not get injured. So that's how antibiotic resistance is. How did this start? Antibiotic resistance occurred early in the days of antibiotic balls because, okay, probably there's antibiotic, there's resistance penicillin today. Tomorrow we found to prefer that same. So people are not really bothered, like, okay, if, if this one is resistant, we'll find out that one. Tell you about the, if this one is down, there's one to rise up and fight for us. But not anymore. Antibiotic resistance is, antibiotic resistance is increasing. But the development, of the development of new antibiotics has not followed suit. The, the, the antibiotic, unlike those days, when anytime there's resistance against this, disease, we find a new antibiotic that can work and str that is stronger than the previous one. But the case is not so anymore. 
the situation is so dire that WHO, the World Health Organization, has designated antimicrobial resistance as a major public health threat. And I, I know as serious as the World Health Organization is, something simple cannot get their attention. So antibiotic resistance is a new donor. We have to be very careful. Did you know that the last time antibiotic was developed for clinical use was in 1978? I was not even born back then. <laughs> so this is a graph showing the discovery void of antibiotics so it's from 1990 to 2010. I don't think that from this graph since 2010, you can see there's an arrow continuing showing that even till now, we've not found any, we, there are no money on antibiotics. And you can see that from 1950 to 1960, that's when a lot of antibiotics were found. And that was known as golden age because there are a lot of antibiotics. Half of the antibiotics we use today were found in the golden age of, of, of antibiotic discovery. So the situation is not so bad. We can still take caution. We can still save our antibiotics. How can we ensure we don't end up in life without antibiotics? How can we ensure tomorrow I don't have a stomach ache that is, is confirmed to be due to a bacterial infection? I take 1,000 days of flagyl, but it's not working. We have to make effective use of the antibiotics we have now to so arrest the ever increasing trend of antibiotic resistance. Keeping antibiotics safe is everyone's problem, is everyone's responsibility. It's not my responsibility alone, it's not the doctor's responsibility alone, it's not the pharmacist's responsibility responsibility alone. It's not the nurse's responsibility alone. Responsive use of antibiotics can help stop resistant bacteria from developing and help keep antibiotics effective for use for our future generations. That is, if the doctor gives you an antibiotic and says, okay, now let's say, thank God, you followed the right step. You went to the doctor, there was a test confirmed. He said, okay, you're suffering from a bacterial infection. Take the antibiotic, go home. Of course, if you've taken the first step of self-administration of the antibiotic, you do not administer it yourself. You now say, okay, at least I'm a good antibiotic steward. I've gotten the prescription, I'll use it. But if you don't complete it, or you complete, you overuse it, that's maybe they say, take it for five days, you take it for 10 days because you want to kill the you want to kill the the bacteria by by fire by force. That is actually antibiotic misuse. Antibiotic, proper antibiotic uses take according to the doctor or pharmacist or the healthcare practitioners. The guideline if he says take it for five days, take it for five days, if take, take twice daily, take it twice daily, don't take it more than that. Doesn't stop at that. Even if I even if I'm able to, even if I'm able to make sure this does not happen, I also have to educate my neighbor. If I'm saying, okay, I'm going to take, I'm going to make sure I I, I follow the guidelines, I, I don't use misuse antibiotics. Do you know your neighbor can might not be aware of this? He might he might say, okay. Nobody told me anything. I'm going to continue using the, uh, the, anti uh, the antibiotic anyhow. But the problem is that these super bugs, they don't say, ah, okay, because this one used this antibiotic. Oh. This one used the antibiotic very well, though. This one did not use it very well. I will not spread to that one. In fact, if I have a viral infection that has become resistant to an antibiotic today, and it's because it's, it has become resistant, and I'm using all the drugs, and maybe the, my caregiver, or so the person taking care of me, comes and is taking contracts the virus. The, the antibiotic, the virus is not going to say, ah, this one has not missed antibiotic before. Let me not, let me not be resistant. I'm going to succumb to whatever antiviral medication they give me. It will still be resistant. So this common picture, you can see the super bugs are really angry. They are looking very angry and weird with a lot of eyes. The eyes signifies that they are hard to treat. There's no, they are reproducing. If they are reproducing a lot, a, problem, a normal microbes probably have one eyes, but some have two, some have there is some, this one has like, I don't know, this six of, or seven. This one has a very big eyes and a wide mouth. That's just, they are really angry at us. They are angry, but they are also happy. I think, I think I can see a smile on some of them's faces. They are really happy because they are like, okay, you guys are not taking your antibiotics, Abby. Don't worry, we are coming for you. And there's a caption that says, if we don't use our antibiotic, if we don't stop our antibiotic misuse in the coming years, they become ineffective, leaving me and you with the super bugs. There's not, there's no antibiotic at that point, but it's now me, you that you are watching, and the super bugs. So let's it's be a fight to the finish, and I pray we survive. So how would they work without antibiotics? Look, our antibiotics will not magically disappear, of course. Uh, my penicillin will not disappear because, it, because there's a bug resistant to it somewhere. The will simply become infected. Imagine you have diarrhea of this century. If you've seen someone with this with this century before, you know that it's, it's really scary. The person loses weight within a couple of days. There's lots of electrolytes from the body. And it's a very dire situation. It's become very fatal because there's no antibiotic to treat it. 
more people could die from post-operative infections because antibiotics that used to prevent infections are no longer effective. Do you know in the theater when there's probably an, an operation, no, no operation that I know of can be done with, on, without the presence of prophylactic antibiotics. That's antibiotics that are able to prevent infections. Infections are so, are so, are so scary that we, we don't even know if they are there or they are microorganisms, but we also have to prevent them. Now imagine where now, thank God for knowledge, we know we can prevent them, but the, none of our antibiotics are working. That's it's going to be a really deadly situation. Imagine excretion a pain from, a, from an ulcer. There's a type of ulcer that is due to a bacteria, Helicobacter pylori. It's become interesting about this type of ulcer is that it's, a, it's treated with the triple therapy of two antibiotics. Now imagine in a world where antibiotic A is not working, antibiotic B is not working, we have no antibiotic to use. The person continues suffering from the ulcer. There is no cure. There's no antibiotic to use to kill the bacteria. And with time, you know, an ulcer progresses from an, it becomes an open sore. There's degradation of the gastrointestinal tract. Everything is finished. This antibiotic resistance could claim more life than any pandemic witnessed by humanity because microbes are various people entering into our body. No matter how careful, you can't be too careful enough. Even we've heard of people that they are using their face mask, they are using everything, but they still get infected with coronavirus. So imagine a world where you don't even know what is what. You don't know which kind of infection you are going to, you are going to contract. And you cannot contract it, finish. There's no antibiotic for you to use. Unlike, unlike a pandemic where there's a single infection. Now, the coronavirus pandemic, we know we are battling against SARS-2, COV-2 is the causative agent. We know that, yes, this is, what, this is what we are against. But when there's antibiotic resistance, when it becomes a pandemic, when there's no cure, when the antibiotics are no longer working, with battling thousands to millions of infections, even myself, I don't know how many infections are out there, but I know there are so much. There are so much. Microorganisms are ubiquitous. You don't know where you can find them. So imagine when we are battling thousands of infections that are multi-drug resistant. No drug will give it to work. No, the dose would not. The dose is useless because no matter how much you use it, it will simply never work. This is a call to action. It is my responsibility and yours to make sure this one comes to reality. It doesn't stop at you making sure you don't misuse antibiotic. It it's, it's continues at you educating your neighbor, educating those around you. If you see someone using antibiotic anyhow, don't share your antibiotics. I can't emphasize it enough. Do not share your antibiotics. You don't know what is wrong with the other person. Don't share your antibiotics. Make sure you are good antibiotic steward by doing this. In conclusion, we must make judicious use of our antibiotics that are left. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've been impacted by this speech. And I I look for I, I hope by my part, by my the previous speaker's part, by the subsequent speaker's part, we would all make sure we'll be able to educate ourselves and make sure antibiotic resistance never where a world where without antibiotics will never become a reality. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Jide. Uh, that was a great uh, insight into the history of antibiotics. We have um, some comments and questions. Uh, we have a comment from Nick on, watching on Facebook to the whole team. Well done. This is a very topical issue. And the advocacy must be sustained at all levels. Yes, we totally agree. And that's why this program has been put together. We definitely need it to be sustained on every level. We also have um, Pretty Miss, who is watching on YouTube and is joining us from Miami. Thank you for joining, Pretty Miss. OK, now, Jude, we have some questions for you. Yes, ma'am. I hope you are ready. Yes, ma'am. Okay, first one. Who has the right to prescribe antibiotics? You can stop sharing your screen if you want. Okay, ma'am. Who has the right to prescribe antibiotics? In advanced countries of the world, where you can't just get a prescription over the counter, you can't just say, go to your patent medicine store, your pharmacy, and say, give me penicillin. In advanced countries of the world, there are, there are st standard treatment guidelines where you go to, the, if, you have, if you are feeling unwell, you go to the doctor and you say, okay, sir, this is what's wrong with me. They run laboratory tests and determine that bad culture, whatever mm. um, body sample you give, right? your saliva, your blood, your stool even, and say, okay, they culture it and say, okay, this is this, this 
microorganism. This is what is wrong. This is what's causing the problem. Yeah. And the doctor prescribes antibiotics. But in Africa, yeah, the cost of healthcare is really sad. And to obtain health healthcare is 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 worrisome because of the poverty rate and all. So I think uh, it's a bit. It's, it's every everywhere. It's, it's the doctor's responsibility to prescribe antibiotics. Okay. Fantastic. So, I mean, you are, there's a, the next question kind of flows into what you just said. The, the person is asking, so should I not buy antibiotics? What should I do when I'm sick? I mean, you touched on that, but, you know, you can answer what that. What should you do when you're sick? Simple as ABC, visit the doctor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and they, that they say, so should I not buy antibiotics? Which is what you just said. If you buy antibiotics... I'll show you that whatever is wrong with you is a, is a, is a microbial infection. That's it. Mm -hmm. So if you buy antibiotics today and you use it, and it's not a bacterial infection, you're just causing, you're increasing the chances of resistance to, our, to, to the, by the microorganism. So yeah. if, if buy, only buy antibiotics under a doctor's prescription. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent, yes. Only, only get antibiotics if you have a doctor's prescription. If you are feeling sick, Go and see your doctor. I think we should tweet that too. <laughs> okay. Mm, let me see. Uh, other question. Can superbugs spread from one person to another? Because I, I saw them in that horrible picture. Do they can they just jump to you know can they spread I from one person to another? Much. Okay, imagine a condition where I'm suffering from dysentery. I'm suffering from diarrhea. I will lose body fluids. I, will, I can lose it. I can lose I can lose it through my stool. Can I, I can lose it? Through my blood, even now, I sneeze as simple as it is. I sneeze the air hey, droplets. Hey. Let's say the person taking care of me comes into the room, does not know, but it's just like you know how we do in Africa now. A lot of people are really careful with things like this. No, no face mask, nothing, nothing. And I come and I sneeze. I just like coronavirus. I take, I breathe in the air droplets. I become, I become, I become infected too. In the condition where the person that was probably infected was infected by resistant, a multi-drug resistant strain of the virus. The, the virus would not say, ah, that one uses antibiotic anyhow. This new place that I am, this person did not use antibiotic anyhow. So I would not be resistant. Anything they give me, I succumb, succumb to it. The, the, the bacteria, the, the, the virus is resistant irregardless of whether, whatever the host is, whether it's a woman or a man, from young to old, is resistant to that antibiotic. There's nothing more you can do about it as long as it's that strain that is resistant. Wow, thank you. Hmm. This is serious. We need we need to really play our part to reduce the risk of anti antimicrobial resistance. Okay, I think you touched on this in your talk, but I'll just ask it again. Should I finish my course of prescribed antibiotics if I'm already feeling better? Yes, please. please. Finish it. Absolutely. Please finish it. Because if you don't finish it, you feel better. But does not mean the the bacteria or the virus or whatever the microorganism is totally away from your body. Mm -hmm. Of course, imagine someone that is that you that you shoot now, or you shoot him on the shoulder. He's losing blood, but he's not dead. He's half dead. The person can seek treatment, just like our antibodies. Just imagine this this bacteria or this virus or this mm -hmm. microorganism as a, as you see yourself. If mm. you are down, won't you seek treatment? The point, the anti, the, the and the micro, of course, the microbes will not leave your body to seek treatment. To seek treatment in your body because they are like us. They are. They, let's say, just say, imagine they have an immune system that can repair itself. Mm. It tries to repair itself and become good. It become better. And just like infections are nowadays, if you if you are down with an infection once, the number, the immunological response, that is the way your immune system responds to it, in in the in the, in the first case. Would not be the same way to respond to it in the second case. If it becomes stronger, there will be more and there will be more antibodies produced. So imagine these microorganisms like us too. The second time they try to infect you, they will become stronger this time. And there's a possibility that the doctor might even okay, probably he says this this first time, take it, take the antibiotic twice daily. You come back, say, Doctor, I'm not feeling well. And there's a there, it is a sure, it is confirmed that this is what is wrong with you. This is the microorganism causing it. Doctor will say, okay, in this instance, I think this, this, this microorganism is stronger mm. and it's, the doctor will probably say okay increase this dose increase the dose take it three times instead of two times i took it before so that that's the case here yeah. thank you very much thank you very much if you have any more questions for the speakers 
maybe you have, you know, you're just thinking about it now. Just put it in the chat box. Uh, I will try and answer them later. Please do, you know, ask questions, make a comment, and let's uh, get some answers for you. Thank you very much, Jide. Thank you. Okay. We'll go to our third speaker now, and I'll just introduce her. Her name is Dr. Wamboku. She's a medical doctor specializing. So she's a med she's a medical doctor and and practices as a GP, a general practitioner, at the Sida Family Clinic in Lagos, Nigeria. She has over thirty years experience, both home and abroad, and she's an antibiotic guardian. She actively works to raise awareness about antibiotic resistance within the multidisciplinary healthcare team and amongst the general public. You are welcome, Dr. Wamboko. Over to you. Bam, that's it. Yeah, I don't know. Am I appearing there? Yes, we can see you clearly. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. The first and the second speaker I have done very well. Yes. And um, it's like um, I'm just going to wrap up um, about this antibiotic, uh, antibiotics of a thing. So I'm, I'll be speaking on using antibiotics correctly. The, using antibiotics correctly is the responsibility of the patients who has been who has been given as prescription and uh, what i want to do is to just emphasize on the simple mistakes that we do and then we that is in taking antibiotics and how we must correct them taking antibiotics correctly so keeping antibiotics effective is everyone's responsibility. So we can avoid the superbugs. I enjoyed this, this second speaker. It's like when we have superbugs all over the place, it's almost like we are living without antibiotics. Because when they are not effective, then the bacteria the bacteria would then have their own way. So can you imagine the world without antibiotics? So please, we need to take antibiotics appropriately. So how do we do that? First, when antibiotics are prescribed, they are given for a particular duration. Like the last speaker said, and then um, I heard the question that somebody asked, should I complete my antibiotics even when I'm feeling better? We know that some people immediately they feel better or they'll tell you, I don't like drugs, I don't like drugs. And maybe the antibiotics is supposed to be for five, seven, 10 days. At the third, fourth day, they are feeling much better, they drop they drop the antibiotics. In doing that, you are creating room for superbug in your own system. Because the improvement is only showing you that the antibiotics is working and the bacteria are responding to the antibiotics. And you need to complete your antibiotics to be sure that everything is cleared. And that is why the length, the, that the length of, for the antibiotics was given that you take for five, seven, or 10 days. So please, let's complete the antibiotic duration. Another thing is sometimes we, after the prescription has been given, Maybe like uh, we have um, uh, cotrimoxazole that maybe sometimes comes in twos 
uh, if, you are, if you are not given the effort, somebody would say, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't like to, uh, taking medication, so I can't take two. They will reduce the dose by themselves and probably prefer to take it longer. That is not appropriate because the dose that you are given will determine the concentration of the antibiotic in the system that can tackle the bacteria. So if you lower the dose, you are only giving them the bacteria the room to go and study that antibiotic very well and create resistance and thereby bringing up superbugs. I hope I'm being heard, okay? Loud and clear. Okay. So, please, let us not lower the dose. Or some may tell you, uh, when I took two, when I took the complete dose, I was feeling uneasy. If you feel uneasy when you take the complete dose, please report to your physician. Don't change the dose by yourself. So, Report to the physician, the physician will know what to do. And another one is taking the right frequency. We have some medications that will say take once a day, some twice a day, some three times a day, some four times a day. And I think the, particularly the ones that are taken four times a day, ah, many people seem to drop on that. There is what we call the half-life of the medication, a drug. That is the, the, how, how much of the drug is destroyed. Maybe in, um, I, well, I don't know how to say it to the, uh, to the public, but how much it will be destroyed by, before you take the next dose. If you are asked to take the drug every six hours, it's because after six hours, the dosage will, that will be in the system, the concentration that will be in the system, is not going to be that effective. So you need to top up. That is why you are asked to take it every six hours. So if you skip and maybe you take it three times a day, you may be missing out on the concentration of the drug in the blood and that may not be effective to kill the bacteria so it is important that you take the medication according to what has been prescribed the frequency that has been prescribed if it is three times please don't take it two times and say and then you find yourself and say oh i at least i've tried out of two out of three i've taken twice no please take it accordingly or uh, if, if the doctor tells you, oh, I'm going to give you medication that is going to be four times a day. Um, well, if you know that you're not going to be able to take it four times a day, say it out. The, there may be an alternative. Let the doctor give that alternative. That is, we are talking of the right frequency. Then we are talking of the Okay, just a slight pause in the network. We'll just give um, Dr. Wambuko time to come back on. Uh, Farmer Med, do you want to just quickly um, define what the half-life of the drug is? Okay, um, like she said, the half-life of a drug is the duration it takes for the um, concentration of that drug in the body. So fall below half, meaning it's going to be too small at that time to actually do anything. So like she mm -hmm. said, you have to top up so that it will start all over again. It's kind of like a cycle. You yeah. know, the drug is depleted as the duration Sorry, goes I, I don't know. The thing just disconnected. Am I on now? Yes, you are, Dr. Wabuko. Am I on now? Yes, you are. We can hear you. 
Okay. I'm sorry about that. I just no, don't no know problem. why that happened. Okay. So, um, we were talking about um, the right time. We've talked about the right frequency, the right time. We have some antibiotics that go once a day. And so, if we say once a day, if you're taking it by 8 a.m., you try to maintain that 8 a.m. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that you take this one 8 a.m., then the following day, you are taking it at 6 p.m. I mean, more than 24 hours in between. So the right time is also important. Try to take it at about the same time, plus or minus 30 minutes, maximum. Hi, Shat. From Ahmed. From Ahmed. Maybe you can complete what you were saying about Half Life. Uh, network is playing up. Oh, looks like she's not there either. Okay. Doctor, already, do we have any comments on the various platforms? Okay, so we've got um, some people are even watching with other people, so they're not Great. Like, Yeah, so somebody says the guys are watching from my YouTube or my phone. They don't want to do anything else but stick to watching. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. It's very so who is that? Who is that that's watching with their friends? So this is uh, uh, Mr. Shea. He's watching with his friends. Okay, so, so shout out to Shea and his friends. Yeah, <laughs> so the, that's that's very interesting for us to hear. Um, I hope we can get Dr. Wabuko back. Um, yeah, yeah, she's trying to log back in now. Yeah, she's trying to log back in. So I'll just leave her uh, from, from Ulufadi to finish up her half-life. Yes. You just tell Dr. Wabuko so okay. that she she's back. back. She's back. Well, I don't well. Oh, okay. Nice. Here we go. Mm. Hello? Yes. yes, carry on. Um, Right Okay, we are talking of the right time. So take the medication at the right time, plus or minus 30 minutes, maximum plus or minus one hour from the time that you took the drug. So it is very important for you to keep to that, to maintain a kind of, um, to maintain the concentration of what is required for the antibiotics to work. We also have um, some people who want, oh, if, if you are giving them antibiotics, uh, at the end of the day, when they take that one, somebody may come and suggest to them that, ah, this one is also the same like the other one. Mm -hmm. And probably they switch. They tell you antibiotics is antibiotics. And worse still, if probably it's taken the same way. Like sometimes we may give cetirizine once a day and Zitromax once a day. And uh, somebody can say, oh, this one is better than this. This is the one I took when I had similar issues. And they switch. Well, we assume that this is just ignorance. From today, don't switch your medication, not just antibiotics your medication altogether. If there is any issue, any problem, get back to your physician. Get back to your physician. Don't issue. And there are some medications that have conditions. Before meal, after meal. Those things are important. Those conditions are important because there are medications that if you have eaten and you take them, the food will destroy. Okay. Dr. A, any more comments or shout outs? 
on the platform? No, not for now. It's just people are so interested in hearing what Buko has to say. <laughs> I like what she just said about don't switch your medication. Absolutely. You can't <laughs> switch them. He says if there's any issue, any problem, get back to your physician. Absolutely. And don't switch. Yes. Important. This is not like, um, I'm trying to think, this is not like uh, MTN and glue. You can't just switch it. There's no potting for medication, please. Yes, no so potting. You stick, you, you stick to what the doctor has given for you. It's specific to you and it's for you. Dr. Wamboko, are you back? Can you hear me? Yes, I, in fact, I'm switching. I, I was using the, my computer before and had to quickly switch over to the phone. That's fine. Just carry on. We can hear you and see you now. This so, network. Can you hear me? I think there's, the super bugs have entered the Dr. Wambuku's Can you see network. me? Can you oh, hear me? Oh, yes. Yes, 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 we can. Okay. All right. So, so please, yes. So uh, we're talking of the conditions under which we take the medication before food or after food. So I said, that if, if they say before food, it means that there are some medications. So there are some medications that, that don't like food. Sorry, sorry, let me mute. Don't like food. For example, you don't take antibiotics, you don't take ampiclox in a full stomach. So when you take it, some the availability of the medication in the blood is not going to be adequate. To fight the antibiotics, uh, to fight the to fight the bacteria. So please comply. If you don't know, ask again. Yes. Because you know there is a general belief that uh, you must eat before you take medication. But that doesn't. It might help if Dr. Wabuko switches off her video. Yes, I was about to suggest that. Um, we'll get her to switch off her video next time she comes when she logs back in. So interesting that we shouldn't. Yeah. Anybody in the room want to comment on that? Did you think you had to eat all the time before any medication? I was about any to give the answer away. Okay, I'll let everyone else in on the panel if they have anything to say. Our other speakers want to contribute. Anybody yeah. in the room actually it doesn't have to be a speaker. Anybody in the room? Okay, it looks like Farmer Ahmed wants to say something. Go ahead. No, you, it's not every time you have to eat before you take some medication. She's mm -hmm. right, like ampiclox. If you actually eat and then you take ampiclox, it reduces its availability. That means it won't work to its full potential yeah. when your belly is full. And then Absolutely. other kind of drugs like um, even antacids, it's advised that you actually take them on empty stomach so they can work. You know, yeah. then they wouldn't have the secretion of some kind of... Um, bodily fluids that will inhibit its actions. And there are some that you are advised to eat, such as um, NSAIDs, there's all these drugs like ibuprofen, pyroxicam that are yeah. used for pain. They, you are advised to eat because they have this um, ability of destroying the stomach walls and causing ulcers. So you are advised to eat. So it's, it's important to actually follow these guidelines so that your Absolutely. drug can work to their maximum potential. That's it. That's it. So follow the instructions that you're given. And that's and why it's some, so important. There's some that they tell you to take, like anti-malarials now. There are some that they tell you to take milk with it. Mm, mm. So as to reduce certain side effects that come with the usage of the anti-malarials. So all of them have certain kinds of guidelines and we just need to follow them. Absolutely. So that's why it's important that we keep emphasizing. You see your healthcare professional, doctor, pharmacist see the right person to get the right information, the right advice and the right instructions. And when you do see them, you follow the instructions that they've given to you and use the medication in the correct way. And do not share your medication with anyone else. As we said, it's for you and you alone. You, the way your body reacts to the medication, 
it's going to be different to somebody else. And everybody is an individual, everybody is different. So do not share your medication and it's just only for you. And also when you have medication as an adult, make sure you keep the medication out of the reach of children. Safety issue, because they can be quite, you know, it can be a dangerous thing when a child reaches out for medication and, you know, they just drink it, especially if it's a colored liquid, because the children are curious and they think, oh, this looks like my Ribena that mommy gave me. It's not, it's medication. So it's important to store your medication out of the reach of children every single time. Okay. Uh, oh, I can see Dr. Wamboku is here. Okay, just before she comes in. So is it, uh, is it our bodies that become resistant to the antibiotic? Perhaps we hear from someone, is Dr. Ok I think Dr. Okoro is in the room or Mr. Babayeju? Okay, let's ask them to unmute if they would like to contribute. Yeah. <laughs> um, Can I, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. I can't, I can't be on video. I hope that's, I don't know, let's see if I can do the video, but I can still speak. Yeah, that's fine, go ahead. Um, so your body does, does not, um, it's, the, and it's the microorganism that becomes resistant, not your body, um, because the, the antimicrobial you're taking, whether it's um, against a bacteria uh, or against a virus or against a parasite that causes a particular infection, is targeted specifically against that microorganism. So it's not working against your body. It's supposed to affect the growth of um, and the proliferation of that microorganism. So you as a host of um, that microorganism and also someone who unfortunately suffering from the infection caused mm. by that microorganism is not the target of the antibiotic or the antimicrobial. It is the microorganism that is the target. So you don't become resistant. The microorganism that is the target becomes resistant. I hope that's, I hope that helps you. Thank you so much, Dr. Okoro. But if the microorganism is the one that is resistant, why do we need to be bothered? Um, that's a really good question, um, but if you look at cost and effect, the reason you should be bothered is you're the one who's going to be infected by this microorganism. And when you're infected, bad things happen, you become ill, mm. um, it's, nobody likes to feel ill, and, no. when, and when you're ill, you actually want to get better, and if you're um, infected by a, a, a microorganism that is resistant to the normal um, a, a antimicrobial that is being used to treat it, it means that you, your illness will take longer to be treated, and nobody, nobody wants to be in that spot. It doesn't no. benefit you. So yes, we should be concerned, and you should be because the organism doesn't actually exist. It, it likes to you know, come into a host and establish itself. So that's why we should be worried. And um, many of the speakers have mentioned that even if you're not um, suffering from an infection right now, you could potentially be exposed at some, port, at some, at some point because we can, these organisms can be passed from one person to the other mm. through various means. And I think we'll touch upon that in, in, in the next session or um, another time. Great, I'll leave, Absolutely. The, I'll leave the other question for when Dr. Wambuko finishes. So over yes. to you. Actually, Dr. Orode, while we're actually waiting for Dr. Wambuko, now that Dr. Kora has mentioned it, I was, can we just uh, talk about next week? We have another session next week. Yes, we do. I will talk about that. Let Dr. Wambuko finish. Ah, she's back. Just... She heard me. She yes, heard me, all right. Okay. Yeah. So if she switches off her video, then I think the network might be better. Yes, but I think she might have gone again. No, All right. she, she's, there. she's there. I can see her phone. Dr. Wamboko, if you can hear me, just mm -hmm. say, just indicate. Okay. I will let Farmer Med finish what she was telling us about Half-Life and okay. uh, drugs. Yes, I think you must start again so that you know people can remember what you were saying because we've said so many things after that. Okay, um, we're talking about how your dosage goes. Sometimes mm -hmm. yeah, some drugs are prescribed um, for 12, every 12 hours, some are prescribed every 24 hours, some are prescribed 
every eight hours. Now, yeah. it's important that you actually stick to the timing because mm. drugs depreciate as the time progresses. Now, before the eight hours that you're supposed to use your next dose elapses, yeah. during that period, the drug continues to depreciate in the body because, of course, the body is using it up. So it continues to depreciate and then it reaches a half-life where it is actually too low for any action in the body. And by the time it reaches the half-life, the eight hours would have been hit and then you use the next dose or you top up with the next dose. So it's kind of like a cycle. It runs like that. Before the next eight hours, it continues to depreciate. The body continue, continues to use the top. You know, it is changed in the body. It works on the body. And after that eight hours, you're supposed to top up because then it would be too low for the body to actually use it. Okay, so that is okay. that is just in layman's term that is what mm. half life is. Okay. So the half life is just basically what the body what what the body is doing to the drug once you take it. Yes, and how long it, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You know, the body continues to use it and then it's at half-life, basically. You know, it's at, it's, when something is at half-life, the spoon function maximally. You know, I imagine something happened and for some reason, um, I'm just at to rejuvenate. So by the time it gets to the half-life, it has to actually rejuvenate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Dr. Waboko, I uh, I think so to be, it might be better. I'll allow her to take the rest. Yes, thank you. I think it's better for you to have your video off, and then perhaps if we just do audio, that might work. Dr. Waboko, can you hear me? Okay, so just I think you should carry on your presentation, but with your video off, that might help the network. Okay. Let me okay to off the video. Yes, and then just do audio. Oh, uh, okay. Let me see. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Is that all right? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So, yes, so we were uh we were talking about the um the conditions for taking the antibiotics before or after food. And yes. there are some medications you don't need to take in full stomach. You take them in empty stomach mm. and uh, they will write it for you while giving you the medication. They will let you know that this medication is going to be in empty stomach. In fact, I tell people generally, I say any of the medication that is four times a day, is meant to be in empty stomach because looking at it you're supposed to take it by 6 a.m when you're not when you have not yet taken your breakfast and then you take it again by 12 noon when you are about to take your uh, your lunch and you take it at 6 p.m and then the next is supposed to be 10 but sometimes we say we can, you can take it by 11. so those ones are purely in empty stomach. And then another thing is some people use like um, drinks, uh, minerals, wine, and uh, to take their medication. That is not right. It may affect the absorption of the, um, the antibiotic in the stomach and the availability of the uh, medication in the, in the blood. So, Take your medication with water, except otherwise stated. Some will take with milk. If you take something like uh, the, uh, the, the tetracyclines with milk, you have destroyed the, the medication already. So you don't take antibiotics with any other thing apart from water. So take them in water, with water, well, we prefer that you take them with ordinary water or a little warm water. Well, some can take it with cold, but it's not that advisable. So we are talking about the using antibiotics correctly. And we have mentioned a few things. Don't shorten the duration. Don't lower the dose. Take it at the right time, right frequency. 
don't change the medication, comply with whether it is before or after food, and use water to take your antibiotics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mabuko. We, we made it to the end eventually. <laughs> okay. Do we have any questions for Dr. Wamboko? Uh, we had one earlier, but are there any more? And I, okay. just let me just have a look. Um, okay, okay, there's one here, Dr. Wamboko. Yes. It's, yes. The question is, what about if my doctor does not know about antibiotics resistance, and the doctor just writes a prescription for me? Can I share with my doctor what I've learned today? Of course, yes. You can, you can. But I doubt if doctor, the, the physician does not know about antibiotic resistance. See, that is why in so many situations, we go ahead and do um, the lab test that will give us whether the the bacteria is resistant to the medication we want or not. And we will now give the medication according to the mm. sensitivity of the bacteria. Even though we can sometimes give the drug empirically, that is, we know that it's a broad spectrum antibiotic, and then we don't want to maybe go ahead and do, but we know that this drug is very good for this particular kind of bacteria mm -hmm. but for the most part we do the sensitivity test okay okay excellent we have another question from Shay. what can i do if i can't access a medical practitioner easily to get a prescription well i think there is no alternative mm. um well we have what what happens is that we have um, some pharmacies that, and then we have some physicians around in the community who are ready to help. Okay. Like, I know that there are some, uh, some, some pharmacies that send patients to me. They, they don't want to sell the antibiotics without a prescription. They send them back to me. Yes. After I have checked the patient, I may give them or change. The, the antibiotics and then give a proper prescription. So um, we pray that some, somebody will be able to access than take the risk because ideally the pharmacist will not even sell it to you. So you are going to go, probably you will go to Quack who will now sell the mm. medication to you. So what about, for example, someone is in, in the rural area? And in not the rural have access. area, yes. In the rural area, we still we still have um um we still have. Is a rural area we don't have hospitals? The best thing is still to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. The best thing he said, and then how will you even know that you need the antibiotics? Yes. Just like. We have been, we've, we've been, we've been taught. Some things, yes. many things are viral. Mm. That you have cough does not mean that it is bacteria. Mm. It mm. could well be viral. In fact, the viral causes are more than bacterial causes. Diarrhea, it could be well, but uh, it could be well viral. Diarrhea can be caused even by malaria. So, and then you go ahead and take antibiotics. So it is best to still try to get the physician. These days, we also have consultation uh, on, uh, may, online. Okay, have yes. On phone. Yes. So, so all those at least are to, you know, uh, improve people's ability to access the physician. Okay, that's great. Yes, that's true. We have teleconsultations coming up now where uh, patients can speak to healthcare yes. professionals, where, like you said, uh, video on their mobile phone and so on. Okay, thank you. Okay, <laughs> so another question. How can I protect myself and my family from antibiotic resistance? 
sorry, uh, let, let me get that again. How can I protect myself and my family from antibiotic resistance? By not self medicate uh, by avoiding self medication with antibiotics. Don't take, don't give to the children. Whenever it is prescribed, make sure you complete the your prescription and follow the proper use of antibiotics like we have just talked about. That is the best way to prevent your family, I mean, your family, uh, to protect your family from antibiotic, um, bacterial resistance. Okay. Yes, I mean, thank you for that. Our next week we'll also be talking more about the preventative measures that people can take yes. to, for, um, to avoid infection. All right, okay. So um, there's a comment or question. Please, how come 80% okay. of Nigerians have been using flagell and tetracycline for years, especially for tummy upset doing its supposed work? So I think what they're trying to say that, you know, how come they've been taking it for years that it's supposedly working? Um, like, like I have said, sometimes <laughs> you see like flagell, they will take it once or twice and then they will say the diarrhea has stopped. Mm -hmm. It may never, it may Does anyone else in the room want to take that question? Okay. Are you, are you, are you hearing okay, me? Okay, we can hear you. We can hear you. Go yeah. ahead. So the bacteria, the, the, the thing, the, some viral can be self-limiting. So whether you took the flagell or you did not take, it could have stopped. Mm. So let uh, so they assume that it is because of the flagell they are taking that made the diarrhea to stop. Mm. Mm. So it's an assumption and it is part of the ignorance we are fighting. Mm. And that's that why we're here, educating everyone. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. You were going to say something else. Um, uh, no, uh, no, that's, that's, about, that's about it. That uh, it, may not, it may not have been the, the drug that treated it. But we are now fighting. We are now telling many people that, look, you can do without taking these antibiotics. Build up your immunity. Allow your immunity to build up. In fact, the common one now is not even diarrhea. It is the issue of typhoid. Mm. And, typhoid. And in fact, they will tell you that they are treating typhoid and malaria. Typhoid and malaria. Typhoid, as if they are twin. How, how, how? So in there is a terrible abuse of ciproxine, uh, ciprofloxacin mm. and mm. amoxil. Terrible wow. abuse. Wow. And people are coming down. The young world being, after taking so much of it, you see, coming down with uh, organ defects. Mm. And it is, go to, when you go to the teaching hospital, you see how many young people, people in their middle age that are there because of renal failure. Wow. So, what you're saying is that people are self-diagnosing themselves to have malaria and typhoid and then they're going to buy the superfluoxetine? Yes. Yes. Mm, Once wow. they just feel not feeling too good, they will, they will say I have malaria and typhoid. Wow. I, uh, okay. I'm, I, I know how much I fight they don't. I try to convince them, but somehow my patients are coming to understanding. We will do the test, see the malaria, and then we'll go ahead and treat. And I will tell them if this thing persists beyond five days, mm -hmm. come back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you see that they won't come back. And now, they, since they now know that it is just malaria, they will take the anti malaria and get well. Mm. And the next time, when they, well, they will believe me that it was not actually typhoid, typhoid. that they had. Mm. Wow, I think Fah Mohammed wants to make a comment in relation to this uh, question. Go ahead. 
Yes, um, Ma, I don't think it's completely their fault. Okay. There's this um, empirical diagnosis every time, you know, especially in this public, all these smaller hospitals, these primary healthcare centers, where diagnosis isn't exactly very common. A lot okay. of them go there and then empirically, they just diagnose malaria and typhoid. Right. And okay. so they have heard malaria and typhoid so many times that they assume that every time they feel unwell, it is both mm. malaria and typhoid. So because they have been given an anti-malaria and superfluxacin before, they just go straight ahead to buy it. So I think we need to counsel people. We need to <clears throat> let people know that it's not every time you feel unwell that it's actually malaria and typhoid. They have just been confused to believe that this is what it is. I so see. it's not the healthcare practitioners in those um, primary healthcare centers, all these that have no direct access to diagnosis, to diagnostic tools, they also have to be counseled. You just can't mm. continue doing empirical diagnosis and telling people that it is malaria and typhoid when it is not. So it's not completely their fault. Whichever patient comes in, we just do our bits to help them understand. Okay, I mean, thank you. We, I mean, we also run training for healthcare workers. So this is specifically for the public. Yeah. And then we have, you know, everybody is being carried along. Everybody is being trained because, you know, the you know, information keeps, Changing to everybody to keep up to date. And that's why we emphasize continuous professional development. So we have trainings for healthcare workers. And, you know, the you know what we're doing with me, me, you, and the Superbugs is to continue to raise the awareness. So, I mean, there are different kind of prongs to the road, as it were. But this one is focusing on the public. And we do have where we train uh, healthcare professionals. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's a multidisciplinary effort. We everybody, everybody is needed to, um, what's the word? You know, to be on this uh, train to try and reduce antimicrobial resistance. You know, so MDT is what yes. we encourage. Multidisciplinary team of all the healthcare professionals and the patient playing their part. We're all in it together because the healthcare professional can become a patient. So, you know. Is one way there are all patients, so all of us have to do our part. So thank you, thank you. Yes, Doctor um, Wamboko, please. Let, can you just, uh, you know, I just talked about multidisciplinary team working. Can you just talk, if, you know, talk a bit more about yeah. that? Can you hear me? Um, please come again. I said, could you please Hello? talk about the importance of the multi multidisciplinary work team working? That everybody is working together, all the different oh. healthcare professionals. Yes. Um, yes, it's very, very important. One, okay, maybe the doctor sees the patient and um, clinically he suspects something. He suspects a bacterial infection. Um, somebody was mentioning mentioned UTI here. Maybe mm -hmm. it, that is UTI is urinary tract infection. Yeah. We wouldn't want to go ahead and just treat urinary tract infection and assume that it is bacterial infection. We will now send it to the lab. So the lab scientist comes in there. So the lab scientist does his own job and then gives me, gives the physician back the results and said, okay, this antibiotic, well, we were able to see that this thing is bacterial infection and then we have to use antibiotics. And then we'll give you the antibiotics that can work in that particular situation. And yes. you'll go ahead and make your prescription. And when you make your prescription, the person takes it to the pharmacist and then the pharmacist dispenses the medication and tells you, how to take it. You see, it is not just one person. Mm. We I mean, everyone is involved. The yeah. pharmacist is involved, the lab scientist is involved, the doctor is involved, and some uh, the nurse may also be involved. So it is not a one man business. Mm. Health is not one man's business. It's not At just all. the doctor. It's not Absolutely. just the pharmacist. It's not just the nurse. Mm -hmm. It's not just the lab scientist. Mm -hmm. We all have our different roles. Uh, Absolutely. I, I, the doctor, won't do the lab work. The lab scientist will not prescribe it or give the medication. The pharmacist would, would get the prescription and then give the medication. 
So it's a multidisciplinary issue if we must use antibiotics well. And antibiotics is not an OTC. That is over-the-counter medication. It is a drug of pres for prescription. So it must be prescribed for one to be able to take it. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yes. So what we're emphasizing here is it's a team effort, multidisciplinary effort. Everybody plays their part, including the patient. The patient is part of this team. Yes. And everybody's working to get the patient better in whatever it is that, you know, the diseases or the condition may be. So everybody needs to work together and help each other. Okay. So we have a question here about um, Staphylococcus aureus. Please, what is the natural cure for superbugs? That one, ha that one has been battling with since three years ago. It started as Staphylococcus aureus and it later turned to methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Dr. Wamboko? Um, yes. Do you hear me? I, I, yes, that is, um, somebody is saying he had a staph infection. Yes. And then that is about Yes, they go. Yes. And now it's a uh, thin uh, resistance staff aureus. Yes. So they say, what is it? Is that is, okay. is there a natural cure for superbugs that she's been battling with superbugs for the since three years for the last three years? Um, to the best of my knowledge, I I can't really say that there is a natural cure. Um, that is like we're talking of herbal, herbal medication. Mm. Um, let me make this comment. Staph aureus is one bacteria that frightens people and that people have been deceived into believing so many things about. They, you know, they will tell, in fact, you see the a signboard with big, big inscription, Staph aureus doctor. Mm. Staff, aureus, yes, we know can be a tough bacteria. Mm -hmm. And why is staff a tough one? Staff is a, a common bacteria that rests on the skin. And if you know our skin, our skin is very tough. So for anything to break through the skin and give you like a boil, that's bacteria must be tough. Hmm. But like we said, before this person reached this stage, it's like they may have been, I'm not saying it must be, there may have been an abuse somewhere that had made this resistance, that has caused the resistance. But that notwithstanding, we have medications now that go beyond this resistance to treat. The only thing is that they are very expensive antibiotics. They are new in the system, and because they are very expensive, people have not been able to abuse them. So that may be the option, but whoever has this is, I mean, it's best to get back to the uh, to your physician and complain. Give a give a full history, or even if it's another physician, give a good history. And mm. they will do a follow up. Nothing is impossible. But it is difficult. It's not going to be an easy task. Easy task. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I mean, you know, we're just talking about um, um, possibly people just going into, you know, certain places and just buying drugs without prescription. So there's a, there's a question and okay. comment too. There are two, and I'm going to, I think they are linked together. Uh, and the first one says, is there any clinical quality checks in Nigeria? If there is, why are they not doing anything about all those that are not operating up to standard? So that's, kind, that's, that's one side. And then the other side is, um, another com the co other comment is from Oluwashi Babalola and says, this is very informative and I suggest we get more information in the newspapers radio jingles, blogs, and most especially chemists and pharmacists. Government intervention is needed yeah. too. So that government intervention bit is linked you know, back to the first 
uh, statements to question about quality checks. So, government interventions, question mark. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, like every other thing in Nigeria, we know the right thing, but are we doing the right thing? Mm. Uh, somebody walks into um, um, a chemist because I just assume that pharmacists will not want to uh, patent drug seller. The patent drug person is supposed to sell OTCs according to the license. But our people don't know, and now people don't know the difference between the patent drug, uh, drug seller and the pharmacy. Mm. And these people will pack the antibiotics and keep there. Right. And then they will just go, and then with that prescription, they will sell. Mm. So it's a big problem. It's a big problem. Everybody, everyone is trying to leave. Mm. And for, for instance, like now that they know that many people are after ciprofloxacin, they know their, their, their stores for oh. ciprofloxacin. And mm. somebody just come and say, I want medicine for typhoid and malaria. So they will just give antibiotics for three, four, five days. Who treats typhoid with five days? In five days. They will just give them that and then give them anti-malaria and they will go. Mm. Well, the government, they are not checking. It's only when somebody gets into trouble, that is when they check. I remember somebody being, I mean, somebody coming to me. It happens to be maybe a member of my, I mean, a member of, the, uh, of where I stay, mm -hmm. and then came and said that the police are harassing the wife because he treated somebody. And then the person, even though he got well, but the person decided to report because he wanted to make some money that this person used to treat me. It's not licensed to treat me and he's treat. treating mm. me. I think we are coming to that level now in Nigeria. People, people having some, I mean, um, being aware of who should do what. So it's our government actually need to do something. They need to do something and clear some of this quackery out of the system. Out of the system. Because it is not of the health of people. So, I and mean, they also need to establish real health centers in the rural areas. Areas. Mm. Absolutely. Like, so, it, as, as the comment from Lua Shea said, we, you know, awareness needs to increase by a lot. What, you know, we've started with this and with, you know, in collaboration with other people, everybody's trying to do their bit. I guess we, you know, we can't always wait. We just have to do our bit and do what we can. And here we are. Thank you very much, Dr. Wamboko, for that. Um, well, Ladies and gentlemen, Facebook, YouTube, on the radio, on Periscope. We have run out of time, unfortunately. Um, it's been very, very informative. It's been very interesting. It's been eye-opening. Washing of blood, contraceptive as antibiotic. Contraception is not an antibiotic. Antibiotic is not for contraception. Medication what? is for you alone. You, 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 no one else. Do not share. It's not a sharing thing. If they give it to you, it's for you. Okay? We've learned so much here. Um, this is just part one. We have more for you next week. But uh, I'll hand over to Dr. Annie Durango as she will tell us more. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Dr. Um, a, over to you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'd just like to say thank you to everyone. Thank you so much for joining in on Periscope, on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, um, and on Mixler Radio, uh, it's me, you, and the Superbugs live radio station. So you've just, as Flora said, you have just listened to part one of the Me, You, and the Superbox 2020 event. As you can imagine, we didn't want to cancel. So because of the pandemic, we've had to take the event virtual. 
And I think in a way that has been very beneficial because we have been able to come to you in your living room, in your kitchen, wherever you are, at the hairstylist, we are right there with you. And the great thing about this is that you can watch the video over and over and over again. You can share the links with your friends and your family. Why don't you send the link right now to even your doctor or that nurse that you know, all right? So moving forward, uh, I'd like to say thank you so much to all our sponsors and partners over the past two years. Me, you and Superbox started as a, as a small project in 2018. And over the past, we would, it would not be possible without our sponsors and partners. We're extremely grateful to all our sponsors and partners who have contributed in some way since 2018. University of Oxford, which sponsors the research aspects of me and Superbugs that have, the research has been going on since 2018, actually. The Welcome Center for Human Genetics at the University of Oxford, Victory Drugs Pharmacy Nigeria, Encapsulate Healthcare Solutions, Inkaba Biotech Ibado Nigeria, Brains Premier College, the Royal Society of Biology UK, Shepherd Specialist Hospital, Lagos, Nigeria. I would just like to say thank you. And we get that comment that came in just a few minutes ago. We get that comment about we should go on radio and other places and jingles, you know, and that we should visit all the hospitals in Nigeria. It makes me so happy that people identify that there is a need for continued awareness and education of the general public, as well as training in antimicrobial stewardship for our healthcare professionals, all our healthcare workers in different places in Nigeria. As we've said earlier, as we've heard from so many of the speakers today, in order for us to reduce the spread of antibiotic resistant infections, everyone is required. So we welcome sponsors and partners, perhaps you're a hospital and you want us to come and talk to your healthcare workers, you'd be a pleasure. All right, so everyone is needed in order for us to prevent an epidemic in Africa and in our own country, we start from home, Nigeria. So you and I, me and you are very important in this. So thank you to all our sponsors over the past two years. Now, me and the Superbugs would not be possible without a wide range of speakers over the past two years. Today, you have been listening to Mr. Jide Babayeju, from the University of Illinois, who has spoken to you about life without antibiotics, the biggest pandemic. And I think that was very, very important. You know, we learned about what antibiotics are, why they are needed, and what life would be if we didn't have antibiotics. One of the things I picked up was, imagine if someone had a simple wound on their hand. Right now, you know, your immune system is fine. It can easily, you, you easily heal, all right? But if they are now super bugs, for example, we already have an example meticillin resistant staphylococcus aureus. And even Haish, our other speaker, which I'll come to in a point, from Haisha Tolufa Diamed, mentioned about vancomycin resistant aureus as well. Imagine if that got into that small wound and there were no other antibiotics left to treat it. That would begin to spell a very serious situation. People could then begin to die from very simple infections. And that's why we need to start now. And then we had from Haisha Tolufa Diamed, also from the University of Illinois, talking about antibiotic misuse. Can antibiotics really work for that infection? Why don't you just drop whatever platform you're listening to? She spoke about, can we use antibiotics for STDs, you know, flagell for, for different stomach upsets and things like that. We do believe that you've learned a thing or two. And then finally, we heard from Dr. Wabuko. We're so glad that the internet connection finally worked towards the end because she was able to take a wide of questions. She was telling us how to use antibiotics correctly. Did you know that a lot of times you shouldn't just take food with your antibiotics? All right, and if you're having any problems, you should, while you, even if though the antibiotics has been prescribed and you're having a particular issue, you should go back and speak to your doctor. Because even if you don't like medicine, there could be an alternative. But if you don't talk to your doctor, they won't be able to help you. Okay, so moving forward, this is not the end, all right? We want to give you six days to digest all of that information. Okay, 
we are going to have next week Saturday at the same time, 4 p.m. Nigerian time, we're going to have this role of speakers, you know, Dr. Chinere Oko, who will be talking, delving more into how antibiotic resistance actually occurs and telling us that everyone has a role to play. Then our dietitian, Mrs. Bukola Amujo from the Federal Medical Center, Biokuta. All right? She is our dietitian in the group. We'll now be telling you, Dr. Wambuko talked about boosting your immunity, giving it a chance. What should you be eating you know, while in Nigeria? Okay, I'm not going to attack Eba today. So, <laughs> because I, 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 I'm not going to do that. But let our dietitian come and tell us what we should be eating, okay? Because if we have good immunity, we can fight off some of these infections that we think we should be using antibiotics for, which we shouldn't. And then we are going to have a superintendent pharmacist, Mr. Spolashade Olawa from Victory Drugs Lagos, Nigeria, who will be delving more into the practical and extended talk about the practical things we can begin to do now to prevent us from antimicrobial resistant infections, drug resistant infections, okay? So save the dates on your calendars now. We'll be coming again on all the platforms that you've seen, 21st November, which is next week, Saturday. You can still continue to drop us your questions. So don't think that this is the end. We have a Telegram group, all right? And you can always send your questions to that. And our scientists and healthcare workers will be able to speak to you about that particular situation. You don't have to share very private things. We can always signpost you to the right person that would do handle your case. All right, okay. So it's been a long day. Thank you so much for being patient on the radio, on, on all the platforms. Yes, thank you so much, our attendees. Your feedback, what did you think about the event? It's very important that we hear from you. Please do take a screenshot right now of this link. Speakers, please share the links with your network. We want to hear from you about how you found me, you, and the Superbugs Day 1, 2020 events. Okay. And there is an opportunity now for everyone to register for 2021. We are very hopeful that there will be no pandemic so we can come and meet you face to face. All right? So... On Eventbrite, if you search me, you, and the Superbugs 2021, you should be able to find the registration page for you to begin to register from now for 2021. All right. This is something that we always do. We always do this thing that I'm going to show you now in every of our events. And we have been actively recruiting antibiotic guardians in Nigeria. The great thing from last year was that the Antibiotic Guardian Office now has a site specifically for Africa. The one for Europe and all the other Western countries that has been boosting. Yes, African people have also been joining there, people from Africa. But now we have our own, all right? The one for the UK and all of that is almost at 10,000, but it's been going on for years. As is gradually rising. So this is another opportunity for you to take a screenshot for you to make a pledge. This is what I'm going to do differently with the information that I have heard. Remember, the power is in your hands. The power is in my hands as well. So everyone, if you're not yet an antibiotic guardian, please go to antibioticguardian.com forward slash Africa and sign up today. Sign up right now. Then send us a message on whatever platform you're watching to say, I have signed up. And even when you are completing that uh, registering for on Eventbrite, sign up. Perhaps next year you will get an antibiotic badge. We, we have been very um, blessed to be able to get the badges from the Antibiotic Guardian Office in the UK. Those have been one of the people that have supported me, you and the Superbugs by giving us these badges and that you can wear it proudly. Next week, all of us will come with our badge. So I'll show you my own. It's something to wear with pride. Now, what are some of these pledges that you can make? When you go to the site, you choose one and you get a certificate that tells you that 
that tell, certifies that you are an antibiotic guardian. And you can spread that everywhere on your CV, on your LinkedIn, tell everybody. One of, I'll just run through a few, not all of them, says, I pledge to use antibiotics only when indicated for a bacterial infection. We've heard so much about that. Another one says, I pledge to keep my animals healthy through good nutrition and husbandry, relevant vaccination, deworming, and by having regular veterinary health checks. Next week, we are going to be talking to all the people in agriculture. Do you have a farm? Do you think antibiotic resistance only concerns humans? No, superbugs can spread. We covered that, early. one of the speakers covered that earlier today. It can spread from your food to you, from that animal to somebody else. So it is important that all the people in agriculture working in the environment are also aware of antibiotic resistance. So next week, Dr. Chinyere Okoro of the University of Surrey, UK, will be covering more about that. So watch out for that and invite all your veterinary people. For those people that have fishery, people that are using antibiotics to, to, to boost their fish, you hear more about that. So come one, come all. If you have poultry, come and hear as well. Okay, so that is the end. So I'd just like to say thank you to everybody. If everybody would like to unmute themselves and just clap. Thank you so much for coming. Mm. We hope that you have learned something. All right. Thank you to our speakers for sharing their time. It's been a pleasure. All right, then, everyone. Goodbye. Thank See you. you. <laughs> Bye. 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 It's been a nice Thank time. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, Buki Follower and Shaw. Thank you, Bukola Mujo. Thank you, Jide Baba Yaju. Thank you, Dr. Mwabuko. Thank you, Josephine. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Hi Shat, for your time. It's been a pleasure. See you next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.